EADS is a suitcase without a handle. Several times Europeans tried to improve their electronic signatures and digital identity system, but it lacks interoperability and uh, user and developer friendliness. Hi, my name is Alexey Konosevich. In this video I will explain the flaws of the EIDS system and how they can be addressed with the blockchain. If you don't know what EIDS is, you can watch my previous brief video. Nevertheless, let me remind some basic facts. EADS was introduced in 2014 to replace the older version of the European Regulation of Electronic Signatures operated since 1999. One of the main goals of the new regulation was to ensure interoperability. And theoretically, it was a good idea until it came to implementation. A few weeks ago, I decided to check if they succeeded in their objective. And I can conclude that even though some of the tasks were accomplished, however, as of 2022, the system is still underdeveloped. Initially, it was supposed that the major issue was that TSP, trust service providers, don't collaborate and so users of different TSPs cannot interact with each other. For example, if Alice was a client of TSB Dave and Bob was a client of TSP Eve, they couldn't interact with each other. Alice and Bob had to become clients of the same TSP, either Dave or Eve, to be able to mutually identify each other and sign transactions. So European lawmakers imposed an obligation for TSPs to interact and introduced a technical framework for that. And it appears it is not enough. Imagine there is Bob. He develops his online financial application. His license requires him to ensure client identification. Theoretically, it could be a good idea to use eIDS specifically qualified electronic signatures. Bob can ask a client, let's call her Alice, to sign in with her qualified digital identity that she got from a TSP provider. The law gives Bob the right to consider that Alice's identity is duly verified and authenticated when she applies her qualified signatures for signing up. So Bob may not only sign Alice up on the app, but also can ask Alice to apply that signature to money transfer and sign legal agreements and so on. But there are more than 150 providers, QTSPs, across the European countries, and all of them have their clients, which they verified, identified. And to be able to work with the clients of every TSP, Bob will need to integrate all their technical solutions into his application, 150. And this is the challenge. They end up working with one or two maybe solutions, which for Europeans, for citizens, means that they need to have not one identity which they can use across any applications, but many identities uh, because one application works with one TSP, another works with another. This is not a definition of interoperability. It's a poorly designed system. Europe didn't create workable public infrastructure as it requires more intermediaries and more technical solutions, which of course increases transaction costs for service providers and consumers. That's why I'm saying EIDS still remains a suitcase without a handle. You don't want to drop it and it is impossible to carry on. And here is a more elegant solution based on the blockchain. First, I suggest a public permissionless uh, blockchain, not permission DLT. At the end of the video, I will explain why. More so, I propose to use not one but multiple blockchains in a bundle using the cross-blockchain protocol, the concept which I developed in my PhD thesis. This will ensure fair competition between blockchain technologies. Not a service providers will be deciding which blockchain to use but end users. The core element of blockchain technology is cryptography. A user generates private and public keys. The public one is used as an address to which a cryptocurrency tokens or other records can be attached, while the relevant private key is used to authorize transactions with such assets. So technically, the address is already a digital ID. 
anonymous though. By the way, you can use the private key out of the blockchain, for example, to sign a file. A standard Bitcoin wallet, for example, even has built-in tools for such off-chain signing of messages and files. And it's because it uses the same cryptographic standards that are used in EIDS in Europe. Now we need to build what is called the public key infrastructure to create and manage digital identities. The problem of the centralized PKI is that each certificate authority or TSP as it is called in Europe creates certificates on their closed databases and then provides commercial access. Besides, they store personal data and they have to build and maintain such an infrastructure. They need to cover expenses. With blockchain it is different because the blockchain is ready infrastructure. It is self-organized. It's not free in terms of publishing data, but access to read data from blockchain is free for anyone. So the next logical decision is that qualified certificates must be published on blockchain. Not just some certificates, but certificates of blockchain addresses, which we remember in fact are public keys. Which will mean that a private key that is used to authorize transactions with crypto assets attached to the relevant public key is used as the private key for authentication of a person. Alice's private key will be used to sign legal documents, to sign up on applications and to commit transactions on the blockchain. To update certificates, for example, if the user's private key is compromised, the trust service provider can update this certificate by publishing a new record with updated information. For instance, certificate is invalid. Transactions on blockchain are chronological, which allows us to see not only the whole history of changes, but also by referring to the latest record, we can define the current state of affairs. So if the digital identity was stolen and marked invalid after this record, even if someone uses it to sign transactions, we will know such signatures are invalid, at least for legal purposes. Here is how it can typically work. Please note that it is just a simplified scheme. In future videos I will explain more sophisticated protocols. Alice generates a cryptographic pair and visits uh, Dave's office to get her digital ID. Dave is an authorized provider. There are many independent providers. Dave is one of them. Dave even can be a clerk of a public body. He verifies Alice's ID document to make sure that Alice is Alice. Dave publishes a record from his authorized address that Alice's public key is verified and her digital identity is valid. From now, Alice can publish some data from her address. For example, her name, if she has a business, she can publish her contact details, say telephone number. Her digital identity is under her control. She can add and update any details. In Europe, the minimum set of personal data included in the digital ID certificate is name, date of birth and ID number. But it is debatable as I think it's too much and in a moment I will explain why. The main advantage of having permanently open and public identity certificates on blockchain is that on the contrary to centralized TSP servers, it is impossible to knock out a large blockchain network with a DDoS attack. Therefore, such a situation when a TSP cannot provide data about an identity is impossible. It also prevents man-in-the-middle attacks. So no one, including TSPs themselves, will not be able to tamper with the certificate and somehow fake the identity. But the identity certificates are published on blockchain. What about privacy? The basic scheme to protect personal information is called Selective Disclosure Protocol. Using the framework of DID, decentralized identifiers aligning with the concept of self-sovereign identity. I came across this selective disclosure protocol a few years ago. One Ukrainian blockchain developer, Mihailo Tutin, designed it using Merkle Tree. 
leaves of the tree are hashes of personal data name, surname, date of birth, photo, address and so on. Each element a separate leaf of the tree. TSP assigns the root record to this tree and publishes it uh, on blockchain as a valid digital ID. Due to the properties of this technology, each leaf can be presented independently in any combination and have mathematical proof that each separate element belongs to the same root. Because the root is signed, verified by TSP, we can trust this identity or presented pieces of this identity. We get a system where all personal data is off-chain. On-chain is only the evidence that this data is verified by TSP. Personal data is stored locally on the user's device or devices. It can be even encrypted. When it comes to a transaction, the user applies his or her private key and also presents the required elements from the set of personal data. Alice doesn't need to provide all personal details, she shows only the pieces that are needed for a specific transaction, which is not the case with physical ID. For instance, if I show my Australian driver's license, it contains my address. But I don't want to let anyone know my address when it is unnecessary. And here is an example of how this protocol can effectively work. Alice wants to buy alcohol at Bob's liquor store. The law prohibits the sale of alcohol to a person younger than some certain age. It doesn't say that Bob must check her name or even her date of birth. On his request, the system will return on his device only a photo of Alice to make sure that it's really Alice in front of him and yes or no response on his request if she reached 18 years old, if she's trying to buy it in Australia. That's it. The main advantage of the system is that it is under the full control of its owner. Storing personal data by any third party is a fundamental mistake because accumulating personal data of many people in one place increases the risks of its exposure. It becomes such an attractive target as it is much easier to hack one server and steal millions of digital identities than to hack millions of devices. Selective disclosure protocol is an interesting technology and perhaps it requires a bit more attention. I will consider recording more videos about it as well as about SSI and DID. Let me show a few exciting schemes that will definitely bring user experience to a new level. This scheme shows that providers can have different roles and certify different personal data. Technically, it can be entities which normally don't play the role of a DSP, as they can certify only different aspects of our identity and personal data. Say, a university will take basic LSS identity with certified root and will add her degree record, creating another root and a branch. A landlord will certify the address where she lives and so on. So all new routes with new information will be added to the basic tree. Alice will be building that tree by adding various records of her life and when it is needed she will be able to present these facts. In this scheme TSPs can be in different countries but the person still will use the same private key and identity. Alice doesn't need to have and manage multiple identities. We all know that it is so annoying to manage multiple credentials and access details. Alice can have sub-identities, for example, self-certified. Say she gets her USB token or a smart card but she creates a few sub-identities uh, for everyday use to avoid losing that device. One is anonymous, one is casual for various applications, one is on a smartphone. If she loses her smartphone, she doesn't need to revisit Bob's office. She will take her USB token from a safe place and will publish an update to the lost identity, marking it invalid. 
Then she will create a new sub-identity on her new phone and addressing my initial concern on interoperability. As you see, it's uh, much more convenient for a developer. I would choose to work with blockchain as it doesn't need to integrate hundreds of various solutions from different providers. What if TSP loses their private key? There will be a root address or precisely a hierarchy of root addresses controlled by credible public bodies. And the highest root will be able to reset the whole system. And I explain it uh, in the video jurisdictions on blockchain. Finally, the last question is why blockchain? Those who support the use of private and permission DLT usually say that they want to be able to control the system. And I want to ask what exactly they want to be able to control. Is it a pathological strive to establish an authoritarian regime or a rational requirement to keep things in order? If the second one, here is the answer. First of all, you don't need to rewrite the ledger, censor and rework transactions. If you can do it with blockchain, then this is not a blockchain. It goes against the whole idea of a reliable, immutable public repository. If you want only authorized providers to be able to verify digital identities, you don't need to control the blockchain. You just need to properly design the application on blockchain, where you include authorized providers. As there is no such a problem on public blockchain in the first place, you can create your application on public blockchain where you define who is authorized to do what. And you don't care if in any other application on the same blockchain people do other things. Different applications can coexist on the same blockchain and even never intersect. More so, in my academic research, I proposed a cross-blockchain protocol to build applications across multiple blockchains in one bundle. So end users will be deciding which blockchain they want to choose. In the future I will record a video explaining how this protocol works. Check the link down below, I will add it in the description. The underlying principle here is the free market competition of technologies. I don't believe that a cartel DLT can deliver a competitive technology. From the moment someone gets monopoly, some exclusive position on the market, it undermines progress. The main advantage of the blockchain is that this is the only type of technology that can ensure immutability and transparency of records. If you compromise it, it stops being the blockchain. In my video jurisdictions on blockchain, I explain how to design the system. You don't need to delete or alter records. Instead, you always publish new records with new details about the facts of the real world, whether the identity is valid or not. New facts about a person. For example, a person becomes legally incapable or mentally unsound and so on. And managing does not require censorship of blockchain and compromising the technology. It requires the proper design of the application. I systematically explained how it should be designed in these three videos. Jurisdictions on blockchain, database on blockchain and how to design blockchain land registry with title tokens and certificate tokens. The last one discusses the design of a land registry, but it's just an example of a properly built application on blockchain. Most of these principles can be applied to EIDS. The only difference is that you don't need to transfer the digital identity record from address to address. Other than that, it's the same. Thank you for your attention. I hope this helps. Please hit like and subscribe so you don't miss new videos. See you in the next video.